Corruption covers nearly every part of the map. It comes in many flavours, but no matter what, you'll always be dealing with it in every campaign, no matter who you're playing as. But how exactly does this colourful stuff work and how can you best use it to your advantage and clean it up most effectively? Let's go through how corruption works, the different kinds and how to handle it in your campaigns. There are seven different kinds of corruption in the game so far. You have one for each of the four branches of chaos, Nurgle, Khorne, Siege and Slaanesh, Chaos Undivided, Vampiric and Skaven. You also have Untainted which is just another name for a lack of any corruption but this won't be shown the same as the rest. Upon reaching a few different thresholds of corruption, the region gains some effects that affect factions differently depending on their affiliation. These tiers are at 25, 50 and 75 corruption and the higher the level the more powerful the effects. Once above 50, other kinds of corruption will be reduced making it hard to build up a secondary concentration without removing the first. The exact effects on a region also vary depending on the flavour. Undivided grants increased control for allies and reduced control and attrition for non-chaos factions. These negative effects by the way are the same for all of the chaos factions unless stated otherwise. Vampiric grants increased control for allies as well as a higher chance for destroyed units to be restored post battle and increases their HP when they are restored. Non-vampires lose control and suffer attrition. Skaven reduces control for allies but also reduces attrition when under siege as well as increasing income from buildings and the number of menace below uses in battle. Non-Skavens also suffer from reduced control. Khorne grants increased control, increased melee attack and charge bonus for Khorne 8 units as well as less vigor loss in battle. Nurgle grants increased control, growth, plague duration and spread chance. Slanesh grants increased control, income from buildings and unit seduction budget. Non-Slanesh factions also suffer reduced income from buildings. Siege gains increased control as well as an increased chance for the winds of magic increasing and more ammo for all Siege demons. Non siege factions will instead have a reduced chance for the winds of magic increasing as well as an increased miscast chance in battle. Alongside their standard effects the four branches of chaos also have the great game mechanic which ties into their corruption. Essentially whichever race's corruption covers the most of the map every few turns ascends and all this means is their unholy manifestations get enhanced effects. So if you're playing as one of these factions be sure to spread your corruption as much as possible even if the standard effects don't seem all that exciting. So now we've covered what exactly corruption is and what it does, let's go through how you can use it in your campaigns to get an edge. No matter what faction you're playing as, you spread your flavour of corruption in much the same way every single time. Buildings can contribute to the corruption in their region as well as occasionally adjacent regions. Commandments normally have one option that's corruption related, again both for locally and occasionally adjacent regions. Characters normally spread their flavour of corruption wherever they go by default and can normally pick up skills to increase that amount. You can also find certain items and followers which affect corruption one way or another but these are a little bit harder to rely on with the random nature of items in the game. Occasionally certain actions either from heroes or events that give you a choice can sometimes result in different kinds of corruption spreading through your lands. All of this also goes for untainted so if you're just looking to cleanse an area do all of the same actions as before but instead of increasing the level of one it should reduce the level of all. Now to use corruption to your advantage is actually really simple. You just make sure whatever your faction's preferred corruption or lack thereof is dominating wherever you go. We've just covered all the benefits for allied factions and negatives for others so why wouldn't you want to make full use of this wherever you take your faction. Not only is this useful in your own lands where armies and settlements can reap the benefits and ward off invaders but if you spread it into hostile territory you can make it a lot harder for them to maintain control and a lot easier for you to invade. The easiest methods to focus on in your own territory would obviously be buildings and commandments. Armies will likely spend most of their time away from home so making sure you have a high concentration in your homelands will come down to the constant pressure from within. You don't need to focus on this too harshly since even without building specific buildings normally corruption will turn to your flavour just by being there. However if this region is on your borders and likely to be attacked popping down a few buildings to maintain control and make it harder for invaders to remove won't hurt. As for foreign lands obviously once you take a settlement you can use buildings but initially I'd focus on characters and their skills. I wouldn't say you should dump all of your points on all of your characters into corruption but having at least one lord or hero with some of these skills will help push your flavour in and any others out in no time. Not only will this destabilise the region for the owner potentially causing rebellions but it'll also prime the region for you taking over and make maintaining control much easier once you do. On the topic of rebellions whatever the primary foreign corruption is in an area dictates what kind of rebellion it will be. This doesn't really affect anything aside from what the owner has to face but it is a good bit of fun. I will say that this is far more effective with untainted based factions as they will instantly start reducing the corruption of others if they beat any increases. 
Let's say Khan is invading Siege territory. Not only will they have to push through the decreases to all corruption from having high Siege concentration, but they'll also have to reach a high level of their own corruption to start clearing out the blue, assuming they don't remove the sources. Speaking of which, if you're invading somewhere and want to make it easy to invade, try to target any settlements that you know are spreading a lot of corruption or any armies that are doing the same. Naturally, when you're playing, if you're attacking a region, you're going to take every settlement or at least raise it anyway, but if you can target these specific ones first, it will cleanse the area and make it a lot easier for your armies to move around and potentially move into if you desire. And that is just about everything there is to know about corruption and how to best use it to your advantage. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Like, subscribe, and if you want more Warhammer 3 guides, then check out this video here on how to make money.